communism. No single idea has seemed more subversive to the American way of life than communism. We took the position that bourgeois democracy was a fraud. It was concealing the dictatorship of the ruling class. The small group of people own all the wealth in the country. The need of the working class was our primary activity. If you're screwing the people who work for you, my job is to not let you do that. Communists wanted to produce enough of everything for everybody, to put an end to unemployment, insecurity, racist antagonism. We thought we needed to solve all of the economic problems, and especially the racism, which flows from those who rule the United States. With its hostility to the unequal distribution of wealth under capitalism, and its advocacy of a classless society, nothing has generated more fear and animosity in America than communism. Yet between 1930 and 1960, an estimated one million men and women marched under its banners, believing that the only way to fulfill the American dream was by following the road to communism. We cannot patch up this old system that after hundreds of years cannot feed its people, cannot find jobs for its people, practices racism as a, as a part of government policy. We need a new system. We have to change the whole system. In 1983, a small group of communists and former communists told us of their experiences, their successes and failures, and why they dedicated their lives to the Communist Party USA. We have to remember that American communists were Americans. They had a loyalty to changing America. They were, I think, very sincerely helping to make the United States to a more democratic, more egalitarian society less racist, fairer to workers, to women also. But at the same time, they believed in one of the most tyrannical, most murderous regimes in human history, Stalin's Soviet Union. I had grown up being taught that the only people who mattered in society were the people who made something. And so my father would take me to construction sites in New York, and we would stand there. And he'd say, now watch what these men are doing. They are building a building. And who are they? You know, they're masons, they're carpenters, they're plumbers, they're steam fitters. And look how they're treated, and look who they are, and look who the owners are. If someone drove by in the limousine, my father would say, see, that's the owner. Now, do we need him? We don't need him. He isn't doing anything to build this building. But those people, we need those. So you had to become a productive worker. You know, I had a great sense of the strength of the working class. Got it very early. I went to work at the age of 14 in a silk mill in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. I was hired for $9 a week for a 54-hour week. And the young men who were hired for the same work were hired at $12 a week. And I felt that was a gross injustice. I was brought up with the understanding that it was necessary for working people to organize in order to achieve a better life. So I learned very early in life the need for organization and the need to rely on our own organized working class strength. When I got a job in this slaughterhouse, you work 10 hours a day and half a day is on Saturday, 28 cents an hour. The conditions were terrible. There was no protection or whatever at that time. That one of my co-workers fell and was taken to the hospital. There was no provision for his family made or any kind of provision. We had to collect money in the place to give his family something to eat. One of my buddies, he says, you see? You see what's happening? 
We work like hell over here, but the boss and the family, they're going down to Florida for the winter. When I says, what do you mean? They can go away actually and the plant is operating? He says, yeah, they get all the profit. And you know what they pay you? He says, you know, there could be a better world than that. The Russian Revolution erupted in 1917. As World War I raged, a small group of communists seized power in the name of the working class, proclaiming a radiant new society based on socialism, justice, and equality. The revolution inspired a small group of American radicals. The tremendous event in our lives then was the Russian Revolution. The feeling was it was only a matter of time before the revolution would sweep all through Western Europe and then also come to the United States. By the late 19th century, a state of war existed between capital and labor. Hundreds of strikes erupted, only to be violently crushed. Some activists come to the conclusion that the state is squarely on the side of capital and the problem will require not just winning strikes, but transcending the political and economic order altogether. The communists believe the world in which we live is a world divided between haves and have-nots. They believe there is an irreconcilable conflict between the two groups, and those who have will use any and all means at their disposal to keep what they have American communists believe the Communist Party could become a vanguard uh, that could ultimately expose the hypocrisy of capitalist America and bourgeois democracy and win workers over for a revolutionary transformation of the United States. You had just had the Bolshevik Revolution in Russia, and this was at a moment of great concern about anarchists and communists in the United States. The federal government's main interest was order. And people that they saw as forces of chaos, people they saw particularly as undermining the church, undermining legitimate authority, undermining the federal government were uh, passionate enemies. Despite the repression, thousands of native-born Americans and immigrants joined the party and turned their gaze towards Moscow, where the flame of the future seemed to burn bright. By the mid-1920s, the Soviet Union had begun to stabilize itself as a socialist country and the revolutionary center of the world. The supreme authority of world communism was the Communist International, known as the Comintern. The American Communist Party, like all communist parties in the world, was subject to its supervision and control. By 1928, Joseph Vissarionovich Stalin had all but eliminated his rivals for power, and now controlled the state and the Comintern. Stalin was a very tense man. He rarely smiled. He looked at everybody uh, with a kind of appraising eye. In 1929, Stalin accused the leaders of the American party of deviating from the party line. He demanded they step down. To his astonishment, they defied him. Stalin blows up. He starts screaming. Who do you think you are to defy me and to defy the Comintern? You go back to the United States and the only people that will follow you will be your wives and your mothers. It was a defining moment because what it said very clearly was that when there was a conflict between the American Communist Party and the wishes of the Comintern, the members of the party would change their minds and support the Comintern.
Stalin predicted that, for capitalism, it was five minutes to midnight. This prediction seemed misguided for America. But in 1929, an economic earthquake shattered the nation. Almost one-fourth of American workers were to become unemployed, hungry, and homeless. The Great Depression would turn dreams into nightmares, success into failure, and faith into despair. But America's communists were filled with hope that the revolutionary hour had struck at last. Party program did call for a revolutionary way out of the crisis. William Z. Foster, one of the party's leaders, wrote, overthrowing capitalism and establishing a Soviet system will require a conscious revolutionary act by the great toiling masses, led by the Communist Party. They were great at protesting the state. They were great at protest. But, you know, what do you do the day after the revolution? While some party leaders were intoxicated with revolutionary dreams of a utopian future, rank and file members were soberly grappling with practical solutions to immediate problems. We didn't campaign much in those days for socialism. It was not understood by many American workers. We campaigned for the right to organize, for the right of workers to live like dignified human beings, for higher wages, for the right to unions, for the government to take care of those that couldn't get jobs in private industry. Of course, Herbert Hoover was president at the time, and Hoover's mentality was it was not the business of government to do anything about such problems, that the private enterprise will take care of all of that. In the meantime, what were the people going to do? One of the biggest problems was the fact that uh, not only were they unemployed, but uh, had no place to live. And one of our big efforts was the fight to create shelters. The churches might have been offering soup kitchens, but the communists were offering explanations. The communists were offering them a way to think about their lives that made the pain sustainable. That's more important than soup kitchens. It made people see themselves in history. This was a tonic. It was a voice bringing hope and encouragement. In 1930, the Communist Party USA had barely 7,500 members. Once an ineffectual sect languishing in the backwaters of American history, it was about to become the foremost radical group of its time. Communists now emerged as a militant, dogmatic, uncompromising group fueled by inner revolutionary fires. One thing that scares the shit out of the government is social unrest. Passivity doesn't work. Social unrest, it works. <laughs> In January of 1930, a small group of American communists called for a demonstration to protest the killing of a party member by a New York City policeman. Steve Katovas was shot by the cops while picketing in front of a fruit and vegetable store up in the Bronx to support the strike dead. And so we organized a mass funeral The demonstration went far beyond our expectations.
many tens of thousands of workers turned out for it, people we never had any contact with before. It was the working people of the country rising up against conditions that exist in this country. People were that mad. Our enemy is Wall Street, the reactionaries, the enemies of the people. The enemy is strong, ferocious, and unscrupulous. We organized two hunger marches, one in 1931 and one in 1932. I was uh, in charge of the New England contingent. We started with about 100 workers. And then as we went through various cities, we picked up more workers who were unemployed and uh, were able to join us. We traveled in jalopies and trucks through the countryside very often we held meetings, big mass meetings, in the center of town. There are over 150 women in this march going on to Washington to demand unemployment insurance and immediate winter relief. You know, of course, that there was no unemployment insurance at that time. That was what our march was all about. When mass unemployment developed, people couldn't pay their rent. a sheriff would come with a warrant and set the furniture out on the street. What we did was a very simple thing. We were successful on any number of occasions uh, to get everybody in a given block to help put the furniture back into the apartment. The landlords, uh, the realty interests, were up in arms and they insisted that the police do something. And at first, the police did. And so there were clashes all over the city. And in some of them, there was violence. Men were, women were killed. One day, the police decided that if they beat us up, those of us who were active in the unemployed movement, who were known as the, you know, uh, leaders of it, that somehow they would solve the problem. One of the detectives of the Red Squad took his jacket off, and then he pulled out his black jacket and came to me. And he began to hit me. Finally, he hit me on the chin, and that really put me out. I don't know what happened after that. But you had a kind of feeling that you were doing something useful. It was a righteous thing to do, you know, because you believed that ultimately we're going to win. By being a member of the Communist Party, I learned that I could not stop the attacks on myself without trying to stop the attacks on the working class as a whole. I firmly believe that capitalism has lived out its usefulness in this society. They thought that it was a world liberating movement. Everything would be solved once we have achieved a Soviet America. And they thought the Soviet Union was actually realizing these utopian goals at the time. There would be no such a thing as unemployment or hunger or sickness or, you know, it was going to be heaven on earth. They had a passion for the idea that the Marxist revolution would alter life and create social justice and bring equality and bring them into the world. So these politics were very thrilling. These were politics which enlarged their lives immensely. 99% of the things that we did were meant to benefit the American people. I was proud of the fact that we were active on so many different fronts, especially the racial antagonism between whites and blacks in the country. American communism deserves credit 
for having seen the ugliness of American racism at a time when most Americans were more than willing to live with it and to perpetuate it and to promote it. They opposed racism in ways that no political party had ever done before in the 20th century. There was enough evidence of racial solidarity happening in Russia that African Americans in large numbers believed and supposed that racism had been conquered in the Soviet Union. African Americans who came to work in Russian factories were warmly welcomed. One of the core principles was that Marxism is going to eliminate racism because racism is a byproduct of capitalism, of pushing a certain group of people to the bottom of the laboring pool and allowing those people to be demonized and to be called a different race, to be called other people. They actually outlawed racism. It was called social poison, and it was against the law. To combat the virulent racism in America, the Comintern directed the American Party to champion the cause of African Americans. And the Comintern make a declaration in 1928 that we must respond to the Negro question first in the United States. And they tell them that they cannot be good communists unless they are anti-racist communist. They're actually committed to bringing black people into the Communist Party. I was known in those days as a race man because I was concerned with bettering the lot of my people. One day I saw a black man, white man, working together, selling the daily worker. And each of them saying that lynching should be abolished, I concluded that this was the hand to shake. I joined the Communist Party because of this. Winston joined the efforts of the Communist Party to free nine black youths in Alabama, sentenced to death on the false charge of raping two white women. The communists decide that here's the opportunity they were looking for. The black guys were going in search of work to find something to support themselves and their families. So the communists see this as not just some kind of sex crime trial, but a trial against workers, a real parody of justice. The party fought to overturn the verdicts in the courts while organizing mass demonstrations in the streets. The Supreme Court ultimately reversed the convictions, and all the youths were eventually set free. Really, the Communist Party saved our lives. If it don't be for the Communist Party, we didn't want to cheer the 10th of July 1931. That's true. The party's determined stand against racism won its sympathy from the black community. The black community may not have agreed with communism, may not even have known what it was, but they understood if people were fighting racism. That's where the support came. If the government was against you, you must be doing something right. I'm going to starve, everybody will, because you can't make a living at a cotton mill. The cotton mills of the South became a target for young, enthusiastic, and often inexperienced organizers. They risked beatings, prison, and death. I'm in a young communist league. 
they got a car. They say, the textile workers organizing committee really needs some people in the South, you know. I said, okay, you know, what do you want me to do? I want you to go to Georgia. There's the O&T cotton mill there, and it is notorious. And if we can break through, we'll get the whole southern textile industry. I said, really? I was, what, 18 years old, something like that. I said, really? All dependent on me, huh? Good luck. So anyhow, I drive down there, and I have to cross a bridge. And on the bridge are guys from the chain gang. And I have to wait for this guy to signal me across. He's looking at my license plates. They're from New York. You know, I'm talking about dump. And I go to this, find this house, and I ring the bell, and this guy comes out. He looks at my car, and he has a shit fit. Get that goddamn car away from in front of my house. And the poor guy is in terror. You know, this poor guy is going to get victimized. So he tells me what I have to do. You be out in front of the plant, give that stuff out, you know, and, and don't say anything. Because if you open your mouth, they're going to know you're not for me. So don't say a word. Next morning, I get up there, two big guys. And they say, you want to go home alive or you want to go home in a box? I said, well, I, I prefer alive. And they said, okay, we're going to give you two hours to get your fucking Yankee ass out of here. And we know where your car is, and we're going to escort you. And they take me up the back road somewhere, not the way I came in. And I'm sure this is the end. You know, I say, well, what can I do? I have nothing I can do, you know? And they come to a main highway, they get out, and they come and they say, okay, just understand what we told you. If you come back here again, you are not going out alive. We're going to tell you that. We're going to break your leg to begin with, and then after that, it's going to be sad. The company would deputize some of the worst scum, criminal elements would deputize them and use them against workers who tried to organize. The organizing was very difficult. I would get a few names of textile workers and I would go to visit them in their homes, in their company-owned homes, you know. So I had to be careful. There was a custom in the South of prayer meetings being held in private homes. We took advantage of this and we'd have a meeting in a certain worker's home, and we'd have his son or daughter play out on the porch to warn us. And as soon as little Johnny or Tom would knock on the window, we would all take out our hymn books, and we would sing, and we would sing Nearer My God to Thee and other hymns until these uh, deputies would pass the house, and then we'd go on with our union business. Until I got to California, unions were about as illegal as the Communist Party. All agricultural workers' unions were illegal. In 1931, we initiated the drive to organize the agricultural workers. I got the fourth coupe. We put a mimeograph machine in the rumble seat in the back, and I followed the organizers. They would talk to workers and try to get names together who would be willing to organize into a union. And then in the evening they would come out and we would discuss the conditions and, and what demands would be and what improvements we would make. We would run it off on this little mimeograph machine. They'd go back and distribute it in all these shacks that the workers lived in. And by morning the workers all had their leaflet. We had had a meeting of the strike committee the meeting was over and a few of us were standing there, just talking casually, it was a hot day. And as we were standing there, three trucks of vigilantes pulled up. They moved right out with shotguns and just fired right into all of us. One guy got killed on this side, and on this side a young fella had his whole arm ripped off. And then they got in and drove away. In each of these places, they would post the state troopers on the highway. They would seize the trucks that brought our food in. There was one point in the strike when uh, 
I think it was the ninth baby died of malnutrition. It was really appalling. And I must confess, I could stand having people shot out from under me, but I couldn't, I couldn't stand having babies die. That, that really got to me. So we called the general strike meeting, and I tell you, it was heartbreaking. I almost broke down and wept that day for the first time in my life it's under such circumstances when the mothers of the babies who died got up and said, we would be breaking faith with those babies. We, we've sacrificed so much. Now is no time to give in. Let's stand and fight. I hope no one gets the idea that these class struggles were initiated by the common turn or any outside forces. They were born of conditions that exist in this country. The party which represents the working class has a right to fight by all standards. That's a legitimate American concept, part of our colonial heritage. They were devoted. They were committed. They were physically brave. They preached specifics, how much are you making? You should be making more. What kind of working conditions do you have? They were trying to underscore what they believe were fundamental inequities in American life. Despite suffering imprisonment and beatings, despite their efforts to lead strikes and organize mass demonstrations, the American party was severely criticized by Moscow for failing to recruit more members, build unions, and attract African Americans into its ranks. But the party's efforts to recruit new members were undercut by the election of Franklin Delano Roosevelt as president in 1932. He created federal jobs, relief programs, social security, and unemployment insurance. Roosevelt was determined to solve the nation's social problems while saving capitalism. But the Communist Party denounced Roosevelt and all progressives as tools of capitalism and defenders of a dying system. There is nothing of socialism in Roosevelt's policies or in the Democratic platform. The idea that Roosevelt or the Democratic Party could institute any reforms in American capitalism were regarded as laughable. The party is, is vehemently opposed to the New Deal, um, vehemently opposed to Roosevelt, and, and it's feeling some heat because a lot of workers think, well, Roosevelt's doing not a bad job. Even within the Communist Party, there's beginning some stirrings of this. But the great threat to communism was not Roosevelt. It was Hitler's dramatic rise to power in 1933. He destroyed the German socialist and communist parties and emerged as a major threat to the Soviet Union. In response, the Comintern called a meeting in 1934 of all national communist parties. A major revision in the party line was taking place. Georgi Dimitrov, head of the Comintern summoned the Americans to discuss their single-minded opposition to Roosevelt and the New Deal. And they talk about their opposition to Roosevelt and so on, and Dimitrov, in effect, says to them, you know, I think you're wrong. <laughs> and they, the jaws drop. And Moscow was becoming increasingly frightened about Hitler. And they had come to the conclusion that fascism was a major threat. The Comintern ordered the American Party to cooperate with Roosevelt and all anti-fascist organizations, and to unify all progressives in a cultural and political movement known as the Popular Front. We communists have declared that we will set up a united progressive front against reaction, fascism, and war. We knew that if the fascists continue to gain strength in Europe, it's only a question of time when like-minded people in our own country will try to organize a fascist-type system, smash all unions, 
and the struggle against Nazism and fascism became the thing that dominated all our movement, the whole movement. And the war goes on. Spanish fascist Generalissimo Francisco Franco invaded Spain with Hitler's help in order to overthrow the democratically elected Spanish Republican government. In 1936, you have Germany and fascist Italy. There's this feeling that the world is, is going down a precipice. And the one country that is standing up to fascism is the Soviet Union. Communists saw that they needed help or Spain would slip from their grasp. The international apparatus sent orders to all communist parties everywhere to send money, arms, and men to Spain. It, it did wonders for the prestige of the Communist Party. Lots of the people that joined the party in the 1930s did so because the party was anti-fascist. I was at the meeting where the party made that announcement about fighting the fascists in Spain. It was purely a party idea. I remember I had trouble with it because I thought if, in fact, Italian fascism and German fascism were supplying the fascists in Spain, what the hell are a bunch of kids from New York going to do in the face of that? You know, it was another one of our utopian dreams. Some 3,200 Americans went there to fight. Men went through battles. Men lost their lives. I lost some marvelous friends. I, I still get choked up when I think of the good men, many of them whose bones are left in Spain today. If there was a proud moment for those of us who were anti-fascists, who were in the Communist Party then, that was it. But harsh realities underlay the utopian dream. Stalin demanded Spain's gold in exchange for assistance. While sending weapons and men to the beleaguered Spanish, he also sent his secret police to execute anti-fascist rebels who challenged communism. In our great struggles to come... In the As the war in Spain raged, Sam Darcy traveled to Moscow to serve as a representative from the American party. I knew that Stalin was partial to Edgeworth Tobacco in the United States. So I, I had bought a pound tin of tobacco. And when I got to the Soviet Union, I went over to where the party headquarters was and asked, would you please see to it that Comrade Stalin gets this? Sam Darcy was summoned to Stalin's office an hour later. And he said to me, uh, uh, you see this can of tobacco? He says, you think I didn't notice it? I said, yes, I see it. He says, now let me ask you something. Do you hear that we run this country by the dictatorship of the proletariat? I said, yes, I heard that. Did you hear that that's not really so, that really it's the Communist Party that dictates to the proletariat? Yes, I heard that. Did you hear that the Communist Party really doesn't have much to say? It's the Central Committee of the Communist Party that makes the decisions? Yes, I heard that. Did you hear that it's not the Central Committee, but the Political Bureau of the Communist Party that dictates? I heard that. And tell me the truth, Comrade Darcy. Didn't you hear that the Political Bureau has nothing to say? That Joseph Stalin makes all the decisions? I said, yes. He says, then you think I'm the dictator. I started to say, you know, he said, now let me tell you who's the dictator. You see this can of tobacco? I'm dying for a smoke, he said. The doctor said no, so I can't smoke. Now you know who's running the country. And he looked at me, as a kind of a twinkle in his eye. He was very relaxed and said, you're the first American who couldn't talk the tail off a donkey that I have ever met. <laughs> Stalin's jovial image masked a reign of terror. Mm -hmm. 
Some 1,200 Bolsheviks who had helped make the revolution were falsely charged with conspiring to overthrow communism in the Soviet Union and executed. American communists believe that all these defendants are guilty. They're all traitors. They're out to dismantle the Soviet Union. And if you read The Daily Worker uh, in this period, it's kill the, these fascist vipers, exterminate them. I mean, it, it, it's not give them a fair trial. Uh, it, it, it's bloodthirsty. American communists accepted executions as a necessary evil to build socialism. Stalin was the idol to whom the party members, like Sam Darcy, willingly paid homage. You can't make an omelet without breaking eggs, was a terse expression used to justify the killings. Well, I had a question. How do you explain the fact the top leaders of this Bolshevik organization that made the revolution are spies for Nazis? Either these guys are guilty or they're not guilty, in which case something horrible is happening. But I suppress these doubts primarily because of the fact that I felt that the Communist Party was uh, my instrument for the development of struggle in the United States around progressive, important issues for the benefit of the people. But these trials were only the facade of the purges. Millions of Russians disappeared shot to death, strangled or poisoned in the basements of the secret police, or shipped off to be starved or murdered in the gulags. If anyone dared ask where someone missing was, the answer was, on Sidit, he sits, meaning he's gone. Uh, there have been reports in the West about it. People just didn't want to believe it. The Soviet Union was building a society that was going to liberate mankind. And you know, some American communists and some sympathizers were willing to say, well, yeah, mistakes are going to be made. Uh, we don't doubt that they're going to make mistakes. But the vision, the goal is so wonderful. So how can we carp? How can we attack them? How can we criticize them? That's going to make it so much harder for them to do what we all want them to do. It's like you invest religious hope in something, and their success or failure is your success or failure. It, it, if they fail, you've failed. And so you, we don't like to fail, and we don't like to admit that we failed. The ground was getting to be fertile. Minds were being changed. No longer do we have to be slaves and just take the word of the boss that we got something to say about the hours and wages, working conditions. Under the leadership of mine worker president John L. Lewis, a great crusade to organize millions of unorganized workers in industrial America was about to take place. Even though Congress had legalized unionization, many companies were determined to resist it. To prepare for the coming battle with anti-union industries, Lewis organized the CIO, 
the Congress of Industrial Organizations, and called upon experienced organizers from the Communist Party who had been in the trenches of labor warfare for over a decade. They were skilled organizers, they were dedicated, they had the energy, the commitment, and they put themselves at the disposal of the new CIO. If it wasn't for the party, there would have been no CIO. Simple as that. Because we knew how to organize. I mean, that's what we were trained to do. And we knew how to do it. We were good at it. One of the organizers Lewis hired was Gus Hall, who had grown up in a radical Finnish community in Minnesota. They, they feared uh, communists more than anybody else. They were all against anybody who organized, but especially communists. The steel corporation still had their private uh, armed force. You know, machine guns and rifles, and it was open, it wasn't hidden. They just attacked and shot uh, without any uh, mercy or, or compunction of any kind. The corporations controlled it, of course, with the help of city police. On Memorial Day 1937, as workers peacefully demonstrated against the Republic Steel plant in Chicago, the police fired into an unarmed crowd, killing 10 men and wounding dozens of others. Most were shot in the back. It was a hard struggle and they were determined not to sign a contract. And so Republic Steel Corporation started taking small planes from Cleveland, Ohio, load them with food for the scabs and, and some scabs, and began to fly them into the mill and land right into inside of the uh, steel plant. And so that became a big problem, what, what to do about that. And so these, these workers, the strikers, took their deer rifles and laid in those swamp, and they shot at those planes and two planes crashed. But I'm always just amazed at what workers will do when they're in a struggle. You know, you met steel workers in bars and uh, you began to make contacts. And then you had to go into the home and, and spend, uh, you know, one evening with one worker, just convincing him, number one, that it's possible, and convincing him that it's possible from the viewpoint of security of his job. And, and that wasn't easy. The corporations had their secret police following you, so you had to get away from them first because you couldn't endanger the uh, steel worker you went to visit because if they knew, the steel worker would be fired. Many were fired. It wasn't just a threat. I mean, many were uh, fired. When we thought in a certain plant we had enough workers signed up, then we distributed union buttons, and in one morning, all those that were signed up and were ready went into the mill with their union <laughs> button on, and that, of course, was dramatic. Party organizers had to fight against the bosses, but they also had to fight against racism among the rank and file. There was a big problem about black-white unity in the steel industry because the corporate policy was to use racism to divide the uh, workers. I don't think we could have won without convincing white workers that they must put an end to supporting policies of racism, and secondly, to convince black workers that it's possible to have a union that is black and white. By the end of the decade, union membership in the United States had almost tripled, and some 18 unions were led by communists. Many a communist union official served admirably uh, in a dedicated fashion, uh, working very hard to uh, address uh, rank and file needs. But the party insisted that most communists keep their membership secret. And they would justify that uh, by saying that that would render them vulnerable uh, to attack by anti-communist employers, and that uh, anti-communism was sufficiently strong uh, that they needed to be undercover. 
There were guys who used to come to me and say, you know, I know you're a communist, but for Christ's sake, don't say so. I remember one point when I was president of the union, somebody got up at a convention and said, you know how I know this guy's a communist? Because we try to give him a raise and he wouldn't take it. I said, I am willing to be paid the highest hourly wage that anybody in our union gets, not a penny more. You know, and he said, well, there you are. That's proof of it right there, you see. Now, you know, the international president gets a hell of a lot more. I said, yeah, that's the problem with the union. All we wanted was a chance to perform our function as leaders of the working class. In the spring of 1939, Earl Browder, the leader of the American Party, praised the Soviet Union for its stand against fascism. When reporters pressed him about rumors that the communist Stalin and the fascist Hitler were about to reach an accord, he replied, there's about as much chance of that as my being elected president of the Chamber of Commerce. The world was set on its heels by the announcement of a treaty between the Russians and the Germans in which they agreed not to fight each other. Here were the admitted arch enemies in a state of apparent friendship. It was too fantastic to make any sense. It didn't. Browder was ordered by Moscow to once again change the party line. Communists were now told to oppose any attempt by Roosevelt to support Hitler's enemies. The anti-fascist era of the Popular Front was over. It's a horrible, horrible shock to the party. They lost huge numbers of members who did not think that fascism was, as Foreign Minister Molotov explained, a matter of taste. When the Nazis suddenly invaded the Soviet Union, the American Party once again changed their lines in order to defend the Soviet Union from Hitler. Some old member of the Communist Party once told me they were marching down the street uh, at some rally saying, the Yanks are not coming, the Yanks are not coming. All of a sudden they heard the Soviet Union was invaded and they said, defend the Soviet Union. You know, we must go to war to defend the Soviet Union. And this was within an hour. <laughs> so uh, clearly they, they turned on a dime. I think in, in many ways that's the lesson of the Communist Party. Whatever the reason you joined, if you stayed in the party for more than three or four years, it had to be because you were now committed to the party rather than to the cause, because the party would change its position, depending on Soviet foreign policy. People who stayed in the party, I think, believed that the party was still the repository of these great ideals of socialism. They continue to believe that despite everything, if you left the party, there'd be no hope to achieve socialism. And so if you still had the dream of a better uh, humanity, a better society for the whole world, if you left the party, there'd be no way to achieve it. Throughout its history, the American Communist Party received continual subsidies from the Soviet Union to support its activities. The Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor gave party members a welcome opportunity to prove their loyalty to America and to Russia by fighting the common enemy of both. Some 15,000 American communists, 20% of the membership, enlisted in an armed service often reluctant to take them. I had been arrested dozens of times, and uh, the army guy looked at my papers and rejected me, and the guy from the Air Force looked at the papers and rejected me. And then there was an old, old Navy salt guy. He looked at him. He says, well, if you'll fight half as hard, in the Navy, as you fought in civilian life, you will make a good sailor. And he stamped my, stamped my paper, and that's how I got into the Navy and uh, went through the war uh, in the Pacific. Suddenly, the United States and the Soviet Union were allies. Stalin became Uncle Joe and appeared on the cover of Life magazine and was chosen as Time magazine's Man of the Year. The Communist Party launched a massive campaign to send materials and supplies to Russia. But its key efforts 
were in the factories of America. They put restrictions on workers' ability to engage in spontaneous shop floor activism. All in the interests of production, production, production. They thought that the larger good was victory in the Second World War and the preservation of the Soviet Union. Everything else will follow thereafter. In 1943, the Allies, Churchill, Roosevelt, and Stalin met at Tehran in Iran. After the meeting, Stalin publicly pledged his cooperation with both countries. The Tehran meeting had an enormous impact on my grandfather because he saw this as his opportunity to really blend communism and capitalism. And he thought that this was a period when the world could make tremendous strides forward. The Communist Party was widely and fairly accurately seen as something that really wasn't quite American, shouldn't be American came from the Soviet Union, was foreign. And my grandfather really changed that. He really made it possible for people to feel that they could be deeply American, deeply patriotic, and communist at the same time. Browder was trying to convince the government that the American party was going to be, you know, more like a socialist party. It was, it was not going to create a revolution. I mean, it couldn't if it wanted to, <laughs> but that's beside the point. But anyhow, it's is saying, we're not going to be revolutionaries, we're just going to be reformers. The party, as it was known, would no longer exist. Early in 1944, Browder made a startling announcement. The Communist Party USA was to be dissolved and replaced by the Communist Political Association. The new organization would become the left wing of the Democratic Party, uniting all progressives in the struggle to extend Roosevelt's social programs into the post-war world. Browder was blindsided when an article appeared in a French communist journal criticizing him for dissolving the party and ignoring the class war. Everybody understood that this was Moscow signaling its disapproval of what Browder had done. They expel him, just like that. He's kicked out of the party. Um, within, within a couple of weeks, he gets letters from his dentist and his doctor and his accountant dropping him. I mean, he's, he's a pariah, total pariah. Browder had misunderstood the Tehran meeting. It had been acceptable for the party to fully cooperate with the United States during the war. It would no longer be permissible in the post-war world. A new line was about to begin, as the alliance of World War II was to give way to the conflict of the Cold War. It was an authoritarian structure. It was not a structure that, that ever, ever, um, ever encouraged independent-mindedness. Every intelligent communist knew this was the struggle, and everyone capitulated to the collective. The only way to argue with it was to leave it. I remember once somebody at a party meeting saying to me, do you consider the Soviet Union a beacon or a burden? I said, a burden. No matter what we do, we first of all have to defend the Soviet Union. That was our primary activity. And he said to me, but they're building socialism. I said, oh, come on, stop giving me that crap. I mean, all, all the leaders all run around in limousines. You know, that, to me, that's the same thing as the leadership of the CIO council. I see that all the time. And they said, you don't belong in this party. But Stalin was a figure who was deeply, deeply admired. The fascinating thing about the communist mentality in this era is how evidence could be ignored, could be denied, because of the degree to which Stalin seemed to embody many of the hopes and dreams of those who were part of the communist movement. They belonged to a party that was hierarchical, that was authoritarian, that was top-down. And therefore, the American Communist Party accepted that what Moscow dictated 
should be the course of action, including espionage. They were willing to risk everything about American communism to aid Soviet intelligence agencies. That's remarkable. It was an open secret in the party that there were people that were doing special work. That was the phrase they used. And you didn't talk about it. I mean, that was the, the norm. You just didn't talk about it. And that way, you could plausibly claim you didn't know about it. Probably several hundred party members uh, worked with Soviet intelligence uh, directly. One old communist that I interviewed, um, he said, they didn't ask me to spy, but thank God they didn't ask me to spy, because if they had come and asked me to do it, I would have done it. So when party members who worked for Soviet intelligence had an opportunity to help the Soviet Union by providing American secrets, really they, uh, they did not hesitate. To them, it was an obvious good that would bring the day closer when the United States would become a Soviet republic. But essentially, it was Soviet espionage. They were betraying American secrets uh, to a foreign power. At the FBI, you understood that the State Department was infiltrated by communists. The Labor Board was infiltrated by communists. The Social Security Administration was practically being run by communists. You know, in all of these characterizations, there actually is some truth that some of these departments were, in fact, more radical than other government departments. J. Edgar Hoover, head of the FBI, unleashed a massive surveillance campaign in a desperate effort to seek convictions of communists any communists. When we did black bags on a suspected communist, after entering the apartment or the home, we would look for papers and documents. We would photograph them. We would look for books, see what kind of books they were reading uh, to determine uh, whether they were in fact, you know, communists because of what they read. We would plant video equipment. We would plant audio devices. The FBI developed so many informants in the Communist Party that it became uh, apparent that the Bureau had become the largest single contributor to the finances of the Communist Party through their dues-paying members. The agents who had not developed an informant were subject to severe disciplinary action from Hoover himself. They would develop a fictitious informant. They would make up an informant. Once you do that, you have to provide fictitious information from that fictitious informant. So the Bureau was getting a lot of fictitious information from informants who didn't exist. Of course, Hoover got a lot of his attention and a lot of his acclaim, a lot of his publicity for his anti-communist dedication. The growing menace of communism arouses the House of Representatives Un-American Activities Committee. Among the well-informed witnesses testifying is J. Edgar Hoover, head of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The Communist Party of the United States is a fifth column if there ever was one. They are seeking to weaken America. Their goal is the overthrow of our government. There is no doubt as to where a real communist loyalty rests. Their allegiance is to Russia, not the United States. Communism in reality is not a political party. It is a way of life, an evil and malignant way of life that spreads like an epidemic. And like an epidemic, a quarantine is necessary to keep it from infecting this nation. In 1947, the newly elected Republican Congress attacked the Democrats as being soft on communism and launched a campaign to purge communists from American life. The question is, have you ever been a member of the Communist Party? I'm framing my answer in the only way you refuse to American answer that question. Is that correct? And frame his then you President Harry Truman yielded to the growing anti-communist fervor and required federal employees to take a loyalty oath he also sought to check communism in Europe through the Marshall Plan. The Truman administration, recognizing that Western Europe is vulnerable to what it perceived to be communist infiltration and possible takeover, 
seeks to revitalize European economies by pumping in vast quantities of American economic assistance. This is not something that the Soviet Union looks favorably uh, upon. We thought the policy was to roll back the borders of socialism because the corporations decided that the time had come when the United States can more or less rule the world, dominate the world economically, militarily. The communists called for peaceful coexistence uh, with the Soviet Union, which in this instance uh, would translate into let the communists in Western Europe uh, take over uh, and let the Soviet Union win. Or that's certainly how the non-communists saw it. In the 1948 presidential election, the non-communist CIO unions backed Harry Truman. I do not want and I will not accept the political support of Henry Wallace and his communists. The communist-led unions supported Henry Wallace, who opposed Truman's growing anti-communism. When Wallace washes out, organized labor cleans house. Uh, the CIO expels some 11 left-led, communist-influenced unions from its ranks. The labor movement, in effect, becomes communist-free. The pressures were that you must do away with this militant, communist, progressive influence in the trade unions. The government wanted to crush all opposition in the United States to their anti-communist position. In South America today are American citizens who, on behalf of a foreign nation, plotted the violent overthrow of the United States government. They are communists, American communists. They were apprehended and jailed by the FBI. We were indicted on the charge of conspiring to teach and advocate the duty and necessity of overthrowing the U.S. government by force and violence. The case against us was two dollyfuls of books that were wheeled in every morning, all showing that the theory of Marxism-Lenin was based upon violence. And ipso facto, because we were selling those books and urging people to read them and even use these books as material in classrooms, that therefore we were advocating force and violence. And the jurors looked with horror. Those terrible books, you know? You know, oh, what's in them? Nobody in his right mind believed that there was a danger of revolution in the United States. What we were really being tried for was support of the Soviet Union. What the uh, government did was created the view that war was inevitable. One of the witnesses got up and said, that he had been at a class organized by the Communist Party. When the question was asked, well, how can a working class that's not class conscious and a communist movement that's so weak, how could you carry to a revolution here? The leader of the class said, don't worry. The Red Army will come from Siberia to Alaska. And from Alaska, it could go all the way to take Detroit. We burst out laughing. To think that an army would cross the Bering Straits, <laughs> come from Alaska to come and take Detroit. <laughs> of course, that class never took place. Nothing like that ever was said. But nonetheless, there it was. It was your word against the word of the government. I turned to the judge and I said, Your Honor, I thought we were going to get a fair trial. I protested. I stood up and I said, uh, this is a lynch court. And I remember him pounding the table. He said, I'll not stand for this any longer. You're remanded to prison for the rest of the trial. As the trial was coming to an end, the Soviet Union shocked Americans when it exploded its first atom bomb in September of 1949. One month later, after a nine-month trial, the jury delivered its verdict after only a few hours of debate. Now, it doesn't necessarily mean that everyone on those juries were convinced, but it took a great deal of courage for somebody in one of those 
juries to stand up and say no. The social pressure, the threat of ostracism, of loss of employment, all that was something they had to consider. So the atmosphere was one in which, whether they believed in the, what the government was saying or no, they just had to go and did go along with it. By 1950, the world seemed to be falling to communism. With Stalin's support, the Red Armies of Mao Zedong conquered China. The communist guerrilla forces of Ho Chi Minh were battling the French in Vietnam, and the North Korean forces of Kim Il-sung invaded South Korea. Once again, America would be at war. You are the target of those who would trample the liberties of free men. You are in the crosshairs of the bomb site. An enemy is centering on you. You are a citizen of the United States of America. Throughout America, there was a growing fear that an atomic war was not only probable, but might be inevitable. Only a determined anti-communism could save America from the Red Menace. The bureaus and departments have been busy night and day. They're figuring out just how we gave our secrets all away. As Congress has appointed a committee, so they've said, to find out who's American and who's a low-down red. I'm no communist, I'll tell you that right now. Even if there were only one communist in the State Department, even if there were only one communist in the State Department, that would still be one communist too many. Well, we've been investigating. By 1950, anti-communism in America was personified by Republican Senator Joseph McCarthy. His public no-holds-barred crusade would be labeled as McCarthyism. I hope the senator will in fact lay his machine gun down. He is too reckless, careless, and irresponsible to have a license to use it. If any one person was responsible for this massive drive against the American left, it was J. Edgar Hoover, it was not Joe McCarthy. If we knew then what we know now, we certainly would have called it Hooverism rather than McCarthyism. A lot of people may raise the question, why all this hullabaloo about being fair? particularly when the people you're investigating are a bunch of traitors. In fact, I've heard some people even say, after all, they're a bunch of rats, why don't we go out and shoot them? Well, I agree that the communists are rats. But on the other hand, remember this. When you go out to shoot rats, you've got to shoot straight. They heard my scream and the awful roar of the guns and the slugs tearing into bone and guts. And it was the last they heard. They were commies. They were red sons of bitches who should have died long ago. And I shot them in cold blood and enjoyed every minute of it. And I'm glad, because I had a part in the killing. Mickey Spillane was the preeminent writer of American detective fiction in the 1950s. And Mike Hammer, who was his protagonist, was brutally and savagely anti-communist. And this was, again, something that suggested a kind of coarsening of sensibility and taste that the anti-communist animus was, in fact, um, reinforcing. Organizations associated with communism were barred from public places. Some elderly communists were denied their social security, communist veterans their benefits, communist workers unemployment insurance, until the courts finally intervened. In March of 1951, Julius Rosenberg, whose Soviet code name was Liberal, and his wife, Ethel, were both found guilty of conspiring to commit wartime sabotage by passing atomic secrets to the Soviet Union. The Communist Party staged huge demonstrations on the night of their execution. To me, there seemed to be hundreds of thousands of people there. 
And then the, the announcement rippled through the crowd like a, a wave. And I remember seeing my father cry. I had never seen him cry before. And my mother looking ashen and very, very grim. And it, it's, a, it's an indelible memory uh, of, that, of that moment. Julius, guilt is clear. But they did regard themselves as martyrs for a cause. Julius did regard the United States as an enemy. This was enemy territory, and he was a Soviet guerrilla fighting on behalf of the Soviet Union. Remember, in the eyes of uh, American communists, the Soviet Union was well on the way to achieving uh, what they wanted the whole world to have, which was a socialist society uh, where uh, all kinds of injustices were solved and its advancement and survival was a central focus of the American Communist Party, indeed of, of every Communist Party around the world. Department of Justice officials have promised further arrests as the crackdown on suspected subversives gathers momentum. Fearing that the party itself would soon be declared illegal, the leadership decided to send several hundred members underground when the open party is arrested and suppressed, they will be in a position to then start up a new communist movement in the underground. We were faced with leaving families, wives and small children, and going underground. Everybody understood that you were not going to come back home except uh, through jail. I spent seven months in one room without ever going out. And I spent another three, four months in another room without ever going outside. And that was a long and difficult period I had. The FBI targeted the families, not only of communists who had gone underground or jumped bail, but even those awaiting trial or just leading their ordinary lives. My brother and I were followed to school for about three years. We were told we couldn't talk in the house because we knew we were bugged. That was the way the world was. We were being watched all the time. The FBI might visit your employer just to ask questions because they're investigating whether you're a communist or not. The FBI didn't say fire this person for being a communist. They just showed up to ask questions. You always knew who the FBI were, because they always looked alike. White men of a certain age, dark suits, white socks, and government-issued shiny black leather shoes. I, I think they intended us to know who they were. I mean, part of this was intimidation. This period is, in all sorts of ways, quite shameful. Those who could be effectively accused of being communists, or those who could be effectively accused of being unduly um, sympathetic to communism, they could be marginalized, they could be discredited, they could be deprived of employment, and in extreme cases, they could be jailed for, their, for seeking to express their views or for even belonging to what was, in fact, still the legal political party, which was the Communist Party of the United States of America. I was at a meeting of the Communist Party, April 30th, 1956. We had received what became known as the revelations from Nikita Sergeyevich Khrushchev. I sat there totally immobilized in this large auditorium, listening to descriptions of the torture, of the brutality, of the, the inhumanity of the regime that you had been brought up to respect as representing uh, a, a more humane society than anything you'd known. And you listen to the descriptions of Stalin's treatment of his co-workers, of the murder of the old Bolsheviks, the ones who had led the revolution in 1917. The tears kept rolling down. I couldn't talk to anyone. And finally, when it ended, I got up and I made a dash for the door. 
I left without saying anything to anyone. I said, this is not why I joined the party. This is madness. This has nothing to do with socialism. This is a crime. And that was it. That was the parting of the way for me. All the things about camps and slave labor and people being killed and, and all of that, I, I never believed a word of because I believed it all to be simply propaganda against the socialist state, the only socialist state in the world. I thought this system to be the most advanced system in the world, where people would not exploit each other, where there would be real freedom, you know, for working people, for poor people, for Jews. And when I read that, it is, I, if you say it's emotional, it, it is not the way I can express it. It was my whole life, you know, my whole adult life, from the time I was 15 until by then I was 41. But I still had hope that once the Communist Party has now broken with the Soviet Union, we could build a new socialist movement in the United States in which the Communist Party would be one part of it. But the party was more and more becoming a sect of people who were so wedded to the idea of the Soviet Union that they could not break with it. It was a religion with them. And they could not step away from it, and they couldn't see it for what it was, and they could not build a new organization. Now, despite all of the party's flaws, and those flaws were many, some might conclude that good came of its efforts in advancing the cause of human dignity, civil rights, equality, social justice. For all of their faults, communists helped to bring about a better world, a better America. But the communists were speaking a language that uh, American workers didn't understand. It was very un-American-like, and it proved incapable of anchoring itself firmly in American soil. Socialism never had a chance in America. It was imbued in the American psyche no matter who you are, no matter how low your circumstances are, that eventually you can become anything you want to be. But millions of communists didn't believe it was right to be concerned only about your own welfare and not concerned about anybody else. I learned by being a member of the Communist Party that I, as a working class woman, as a working woman, could not improve my lot in life without improving the lot in life of my whole class. The Communist Party of the United States is a good lesson in the paradoxes of history. People can devote their lives to a cause, which in many ways is quite moral and helps to make the nation a better, a better society and yet also support the system which was based on tyranny, murder, and lies. American communists were willfully blind to the terrors of Stalinism. But they did have vision. The communists, at their best, reminded Americans of huge, huge inequalities in American life. They wanted what the American democracy promised. And they wanted that for everybody. <laughs> 